My name's Sarah from the Global Knowledge Initiative, and I want to start with a story. I first traveled to Rwanda in 2007. When you fly into the airport in Kigali, two things strike you most. First, there are the hills, gorgeous, verdant hills stretching as far as the eye can see. The second are the marks of agriculture and animal husbandry. Every hill, no matter how steep, no matter how distant from Kigali, is covered in rows upon rows of plants. Sorghum, cassava, bananas, tea, coffee, plants everywhere. So important is agriculture that it constitutes 80% of the economy in Rwanda. In the early 1990s, coffee was actually the most important. In fact, it was 60% of national exports were coffee. And then there was a severe coffee crisis and a genocide, and it obliterated this sector. Recovering from the genocide was as much a story of building back the coffee sector as it was repairing the wounds from the genocide. And it was a remarkable turnaround. Coffee prices leapt from 20 cents a kilo to $2 a kilo. This was lives improved, lives saved. But now these gains are under threat. Meet the Antestia bug and this unfortunate toxin called pyrazine. So Antestia is an insect and it eats on this coffee and it releases saliva and in the saliva is a fungus and the leave behind of this fungus is a taste defect called potato taste. So imagine you're getting your cup of joe in the morning, you take that first sip and it tastes like a mashed potato. This is no good. And worse yet, researchers now think that other causes relate to pyrazine showing up in coffee. So the Rwandans are in trouble. And if they don't fix this challenge, and soon, buyers are going to give up in disgust. Now the hero of this story just might be a genocide survivor named Daniel Rukazambuga. Daniel is the dean of the Faculty of Agriculture at the largest university of Rwanda. And Daniel's story itself is one of hope, of collaboration against all odds. So Daniel was just six years old when his family moved from Rwanda to Burundi to escape the tensions that were tearing at the fabric of Rwandan society. Now, Daniel's father was a farmer and he loved the land, but he knew the value of education. And so he sent his son to university in Tanzania. Well, Daniel went on to the UK where he got his PhD and now he has a team and they are emboldened to tackle this coffee challenge. Now, when I meet Daniel and scientists like him, I wonder, is it even possible to help? And I'm not alone. I know that most people, when struck with a challenge as grave as poverty, disease, malnutrition, insecurity, wonder how to get involved. What can we do? Well, I'm here to offer a new paradigm and it's one that upends old notions of top-down research agendas and isolated scientists toiling away. It's a paradigm that gives hope to Daniel and people like him. So to give you a little background, back in 2008, the president of Rwanda came to Washington, D.C., and there he met with the presidents of 200 universities, some top-notch scientists and entrepreneurs, and together they said, we need a new model a new model for collaborative innovation. And they asked, what kind of global knowledge exchange could bring people, scientists with challenges, together with educators, innovators across sectors, disciplines, and countries? And the answer to that question was a coalition that formed. We're called the Global Knowledge Initiative, and I'm one of the co-founders. And among us, we have presidents of National Academies of Science, networks of universities, lone innovators and educators in Africa, the Middle East, the US, and India. And together, we've made a platform for collaborative innovation. And from it, we're constructing purpose-driven networks to tackle challenges just like Daniel's. So maybe you're wondering, why was it necessary to take on all this effort to forge knowledge partnerships? Didn't we already have this? Well, historically, there have been some trends that have really worked against collaborative innovation. First off, a lot of academic disciplines are like little universes unto themselves. So take an engineer. I'm an engineer. From the time you're trained as an engineer, you learn to work with other engineers, tackling engineering problems, 
probably germane to your local context. And now we have all these knowledge platforms, but even the knowledge platforms keep engineers exchanging ideas, rice researchers have their platforms, plant biologists have theirs. Then when we look to funding, even the funding for science is dribbled between these disciplinary buckets. Really scarce are dollars that support collaborative innovation. And then this gets exacerbated at the level of government bureaucracies that even when they take on the importance of science and technology, often fail to mention, let's take Uganda for example, a great national development plan there that speaks to the importance of science and technology. And yet it doesn't say whether or how a government funded scientist could work with her or his peers in civil society and private sector and universities. So although our model might seem intuitively obvious, it had yet to be put into practice to solve challenges like Daniel's. So here's our philosophy. Currently, the world is populated with solvers that have talents that want to get involved. And the trick is plugging them into doing so. So what we have to do is locate them, enable them with training, connect them to the resources they need, and then build the collective action systems required to solve challenges. So locate, enable, connect, solve. So what that means in practice with a challenge like Daniel's is first we start with this complex challenge and then we do something kind of like mapping the genome of challenge. We deconstruct it into a hundred or more critical choke points and we relate these to see the degree to which solving one sub-challenge allows us to tackle another. And even the process of challenge mapping itself is multidimensional. So in Rwanda, we had economists, agronomists, entomologists, students, researchers, professors, all doing this jointly. From there, we go into putting together the knowledge partnership landscape topography. So this is analysis at three strata, the institutional, the sectoral, and um, at the level of the whole nation. And doing this, we're able to figure out what resources does Daniel have in his own backyard that he can galvanize and use to tackle his, ch his challenge. So from there, from the analysis piece, we turn to training and using collaborative uh, platforms and communications technologies. Once we brought the solvers together, we train people to go from learning the design of a new innovation to actually implementing it jointly. And that piece of the puzzle has been missing in a lot of collaboration um, activities. So far, we've trained leaders in science from 20 countries. So why do we think this will work? Because we're already seeing the results. When scientists tackling shared problems, shared data, the rates of publication go up. And the rates of innovation spike too, both radical and incremental innovation when you broaden the challenge to a bigger community of potential solvers. And then there's some of these perverse realities in scientific research, like the fact that 90% of health research dollars tackle diseases that just 10% of people die from. We think by building the capacity of more people to get involved, we can chip away at that 90-10 split. So in closing, we think we're on the brink of scaling a model of innovation more collaborative and inclusive than ever witnessed. And coming back to Daniel and his challenge, by opening his challenge up to a big community of possible solvers, we've excited many people to join our cause. And looking to the future, we think that we can harvest challenges from the poorest among us, not just the richest. So by building bridges between sectors, communities, and countries, we can see the world in a new way. We can bring resources and ideas together. So the time for collaborative innovation is now. Why? Because we have the power, the capability, and the need to build a better future. And as Alan Kay put it, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So let's get to it. <laughs>